Father, we love you. Thank you so much that you give us new mercies every single day and new opportunity to come before you. Pray, Father, that you open up our hearts and our minds, that we will receive, Lord God, what it is that you have provided for us, that we will, in fact, Lord God, be the people that you call for us to be. God, we lay out our every concern and every care to you. God, we just want your glory. This time of 24 hours of prayer, these hours that we're spending with you, before you, at your feet, God, that our prayers reach your ears. May, Lord God, you be glorified. So thank you. Thank you for once again allowing us the opportunity to pray. And pray, Father, that this will be a blessing to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, family, as we are continuing in this 24-hour period of um, spending time with the Lord and praying and um, making our requests known to him, this uh, time of financial fasting, as we've been in our 21 days of prayer uh, and financial fasting, we've had an opportunity to really key into and listen into what it is that the Lord has been saying um, and how he has really been challenging us and pushing us um, to reconsider our um, attitudes towards money and and some of the things that we've done absent-minded and some of the ways that, Lord, we honestly, we just don't even know. Sometimes we don't realize what we don't know, um, but I thank the Lord that he has given us um, new eyes to see, new revelation, um, and new ways of which we're going to be able to use the money that God has given us. Um, and so we've been in this this book of uh, written by Pastor George Thompson, and I want to share with you uh, this uh important lesson that honestly is is I'm not sure everybody does this um, but it is something that is really important and really um, has some really deep uh, biblical principles and within the book of um, this uh, 21 days of prayer uh, of a financial fasting devotional written by Pastor George Thompson um, one of the days is uh, that is titled "Getting Your Spending Under Control." Um, even the word "spending" um, for some people is it could almost make you feel guilty because I know for this 21 day fasting period, that is one thing that has been under the microscope. Um, your attitudes towards money, the reason why uh, you feel how you feel about money, how the Lord is really pushing us and challenging us and showing us and revealing and unveiling some things about how we feel about money, that money the, the, the thing about spending, spending is the thing that most of us enjoy the most. Some of it is the reason why we work. We work to gain money and we Gain the money to spend it. Spending can oftentimes be the fun part of why we we actually get money, or why we want to make way to make our wages, uh, uh, have our salary, have a higher salary, right? Why? Because um, when you have a vehicle, you want a ve- you want a new vehicle. Well, you want to you want a new vehicle means that you're going to get new money, more money to to spend. Um, if you want something to eat that you really enjoy, you want to try a new restaurant, you want to have the money in the bank to be able to, what, spend it. Um, <laughs> new clothes, new, new, new gadgets, new phones, uh, Amazon, whatever it might be, right, whatever your thing is that you enjoy uh, going and acquiring, it is this transaction between I have money, you have a good, you have a commodity, let's exchange my money for your good or commodity or service so that I can have it. And spending is some of the, one of those things that can happen. And, and, and we, we've, in this new era of spending, actually, we have automated spending. 
we have automated spending. We have automated the, the, where the situations where we are able to spend money and not even think about it. The times where we actually have put things on autopilot, right? We have app services uh, where we, we, we set it and forget it. We have uh, bills where we, we, we put in our information where we set it and forget it. We have um, online tools where whatever it is that we want to purchase and, and they can just go into our account and, any, and, and whatever that specified time is, once a month, once a week, whatever that thing is, and they will go, that, that, that company will go in, retrieve the money that for, for whatever goods, whatever services, and they can get it. And we spend without even thinking about it anymore. Some of you all know that um, you have apps now. Um, as apps are really gotten so so far advanced, and somewhat sometimes it feels like a little out of control because there there feels like an app for everything now. But now you have these apps in which you're able to go in. You have an app. You can uh, spend your money, um, and it, they go in and take it. And so now you're able to stream your Netflix, your Amazon Prime. You're you're able to you know, get your, your, your fitness things, your, uh, your tracking things, your uh, subscriptions to newspapers and, and, and um, Spotify and everything else under the sun. It is, it is uh, an enormous thing. Uh, when you go into the app store or your, your, the, the, the Google store, your, you know, where you can get your apps, and it is an enormous amount of apps that you can just put in your information and set it and forget it. And the spending is out of control. It, it takes no time at all before you realize you have spent more money than you ever thought you would. Proverbs 27, verse 23 and 24 says this, Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. For riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. Getting your spending under control is a big deal. It is a big deal. A lot of times we are either spenders or what we may think of as savers. Spenders are, there's nothing wrong with being a spender. If you spend money, that's not a problem. Spending money is not a bad thing. It is the transaction of being able to take a money and being able to go and spend it in a, in a place, especially for things that you need. You got a doctor bill. You got to go to the doctor. You got to spend money. If you want to have uh, a lawn care service so that people come and cut your your yard, you got to spend money. You want a vehicle? You got to spend money. You want people to fix the vehicle? You got to spend money. Right? Spending money is not the problem. Spending money in, in where it's frivolous and, um, and absent, being absent-minded um, or being out of control in what it is that you're spending, that is where the problem is. Saving. Saving is a wonderful thing. Being able to save to have an inheritance. Saving so that you have something in the bank is important. Um, and so being able to save is really, really good. Um, but it's also important to, to be able to spend what you need so that you can have the things that are important or to have the things that, that will be a blessing. Spending is also just like being able to give as well. So spending, you have spenders, you have savers, but we want to be good spenders. How do you know if you're a good spender or not? I mean, how would you know? Because if it, if it came down to it, I could say I'm a great spender. Well, how do I know I'm a great spender? Well, I spend for things that I feel like I need, right, which is good, which is great. But until you start to really get nuanced and start to examine exactly what it is that you're, being, that you're spending the money on, that is the only way to determine whether or not you are considered a good spender. A good spender is somebody who is judicious. Is judicious. Um, they are... They, they would account for the cost, right? They would account the cost. They would, they would consider what it costs to do the thing that they want to do or do the thing that they like to do, do the thing that they need to do. But in order to do that, you've got to have a budget. And that budget is another B word, right? That budget is something that people just absolutely 
Some people do and some people don't. Some people say, I got it all in my head. I already know what I got, and I can do that. Some people are, are the complete opposite, and they, are, they budget everything. They budget their time. They budget their energy. They budget their, med, their, their money. Um, they, they, budget, they budget their lives. Their lives are, are, are planned according to a budget. And the thing about a budget is and, and, and budgets are not, uh, are not something that we should, be, we should be afraid of. We should not be scared to have a budget. A budget really is something that provides a way for us to have um, a, a way of an accountability of what it is that we're doing. I will say, growing up, never had a budget. And I was in my 20s, never had a budget. Got into my 30s. And when it came time to really start to do a budget was when I got, actually got married to my wife. And when we got married, we, we were able to um, come together and with all the money that we had, and we created a budget. Now, there is uh, many iterations of our budget now. Uh, the, the spreadsheet um, has, has uh, graduated several times now. Um, it, is, it is much more sophisticated um, it, than it ever was. Uh, it is much more cord, color coordinated. Um, my wife is one of those people that, that, that adheres to this budget. She looks at this budget with meticulous eyes. And she does it frequently throughout the week. Why? Because we have to be accountable for the money that we have. To not be accountable for the money that we have, to just frivolously spend, is, some, is, to, is to be somebody who is not a good steward. Somebody who is not a good steward. Somebody who says, you know what, I'm going to, this is what I want. I want what I want when I want it, how I want it. And, that, and those people, they get what they want, when they want it, how they want it, and don't care what the consequences are of the people that will be living in deficits for some time. Those are the people that don't mind being in debt and being indebted to somebody else. Those are the people with credit card bills and, 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 and that are uh, at a, an extreme and an alarming amount. Those are the people that will get payday advances in order to – keep up a lifestyle or keep up um, uh, payday loans and, and will take out uh, second mortgages in order to do certain things when it wasn't financially a good decision to do so according to the budget. But the ones that adhere to the budget, the ones that are able to, uh, to account, those are the individuals that are exhibiting self-control. We know that self-control is actually a fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, to be long-suffering or patient, to be gentle, goodness, faithful, meekness, and temperance or self-control. The way to, to exhibit self-control is to allow Holy Spirit to be the one to show you. You can say no. To show you. You don't have to do that. No, you don't have to spend this money. No, you don't have to consume this thing. No, you don't have to do this. You have self-control. Anybody who is a believer in Jesus Christ has been given access to Holy Spirit. So if you have access to Holy Spirit, that means you have access to self-control. There should be no thought of whether or not you have self-control because you do. The question is, though, for those of you all that are believers in Jesus Christ, are you willing to allow self, are you willing to allow Holy Spirit to display and be Lord and they'll give you and give you the direction to show you which way to go and how to handle the thing so that when you get into situations, you can handle it with self control. You can handle situations with love, with joy. You can be meek. You can be gentle. You can be good. You can be faithful. You can, you can be the thing that God is wanting you to be. You're allowing your spirit, man, you're allowing Holy Spirit to lead. And that is a decision. Will you allow Holy Spirit to lead? 
Now, whether or not whether or not Holy Spirit will do it or not, that's up to you. Because if we allow Holy Spirit to show, yes, no, 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 I have self-control. I can say no. I can turn away the plate. I don't have to go out to eat. I don't have to. The budget, the, my budget dictates that I only have a hundred dollars to spend on eating out for this month. So I have to adhere to this one hundred dollars. My budget dictates that I only have this amount of money to make sure that I I don't uh, default on my mortgage, default on a loan, because I have to pay this back because I have to account for everything that comes into comes into my household. I have to account for these things. You have self-control. Question is, do you exhibit it? Do you allow Holy Spirit to exhibit self-control in you? The wonderful thing about us is that God gives us and blesses us with so many wonderful blessings, so many amazing blessings. So there, God has given you so many different, different things for your life. You have been given uh, access to so many things, and you wonder, and you, some of us are thinking that, well, I want the next thing. I'm ready for more, God. God, enlarge my territory when we haven't been good stewards over the territory that we've been given. We will pray the prayer of Jabez, but we won't live a Jabez life. Enlarge my territory, but will you be faithful to what God has already given you? Will you be a faithful servant? Will you be a faithful manager? Luke 12, actually, Jesus talks about this, that there are individuals that when they were given, what, what did you do with what was given to you? Are you accounting for what was given to you? The Lord answered in Luke 12 and verse 42, who then is, who then is the faithful and wise manager? whom the, the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whom I find, whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time to come in, and then he begins to beat the other servants with both men and women, and to eat and to drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he doesn't expect him at the hour he's not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. This is who it will be a faithful, who will be faithful stewards to the thing that God has given to you? Who will be faithful to do the thing that God has given you to do? Who will be faithful over the money that God has given you to manage? Who will be faithful over the relationships that God has given you to manage? Who will be faithful over the children that God has given you to manage? Who will be faithful over the marriage God has given you to manage? So that when Jesus returns and Jesus comes back and he looks at what you're doing, and he looks at what I'm doing with the gifts and the talents and everything that he's given me, will he find me doing what is good and what is faithful? So the question is, as a spender, as somebody who spends money, somebody whose spending has gotten out of control, there's some questions you got to ask. One, what are you buying? And then secondly, why are you buying it? There are so many times that we will emotionally spend 
we will spend on things because, according to how we feel, not according to what our budget dictates. So we'll spend money on food that we didn't have to spend because of how we feel. We'll spend money on cars that we don't need according to how we feel. We'll spend money at shopping centers and Amazon on things that look good and are shiny and they're new and they're innovative, but not according to what our bid, our budget it takes that we do. There is a really, really um, key couple of verses in, in Leviticus, Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19 and verse 9 says, When you reap the harvest of, the, of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Verse 10, do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. God was given laws. God was given this command to his people to say, listen, don't, don't, don't go, don't reap to the edge of your, uh, lean to the edge of your field. Leave some. Don't spend all that you got. Leave something. That that piece that you leave was important because what 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 was a principle was that there were poor people that were living amongst the the Israelites, living amongst the people that didn't have that didn't that didn't have it that 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 didn't have jobs. They didn't they didn't have a trade. They they may not even had. Uh, uh, adequate clothes or, or, or access to, to a whole lot, but they were supposed to be taking care of each other. And if I spend all that I have just because I said that I can, then I won't be able to give to anybody else. And God has called for all of us to be able to give. We are created to be givers. But if I spend everything that I have, I have nothing left to give. And my account of my life, my account of my spending says that I had an opportunity to do so, but I chose to spend it on something for me. As Pastor George says, a budget is like a playbook. It's, it's, it's a playbook. It's a game plan. We are the opportunity. We are the ones who enact the plan. We are the ones that dictate, and we allow God to show us, God, you are the ultimate coach, the GM, the, the owner of this, of, uh, in this scenario. God, you, you own it all. You show me as a manager, as a coach, show me what play to run. Show me what to do with the money you've given me. And when, you, when God trusts you with that and you show yourself faithful to what he's given, all of a sudden he starts opening up the, po the, the pocketbook. All of a sudden he starts to give more money. Why? Because he's showing, you are showing that you are faithful to the things that you have been given. So if you haven't, start a budget. Start a budget. Start it today. Start it today. Go through your bank account. Go through your bank statements. Go through an, an account for what money you have coming into the home. Go ahead and outline this so you can start to be accountable for what God has given you. And you can prove that you're going to be faithful to everything he's given you as well. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much that you love us as you do. You give us this opportunity, Lord, to be stewards. Stewards over the time, the energy, the money, the love. You give us opportunity 
to do so, to be good stewards. And we want to be found faithful. We want to be a faithful steward. Father, we want you to be glorified. We want you, Father, to be glorified. We want to know the conditions of the flocks that you've given us. We want to take careful attention, Lord God, to the herds that you've blessed us with. We don't want anything to be falling through the crack where our spending, God, has been blind and just been frivolous and automated, automated, and and may and put as a second thought, Lord God, bring it back to the forefront of our minds. Show us, Lord God, the places where we, if we need to cut, Lord God, show us where to cut. The places where we just need to exhibit the self-control that you give us, Holy Spirit. Allow you to be God. Allow you to be Lord in this situation. Allow you to be Lord over our our finances. It will stop. It will do what it is you tell us to do. That you be glorified, God. Thank you for the challenging word that you've given us. Thank you for this time where you're showing us, Lord God, we've we've been out of control. And forgive us, God. That we repent. Repent, Lord. Help us to do better. Help us not to glorify money, but glorify you. And in glorifying you, God, we'll use the money and the gifts and the talents and the energy and the love that you've given us. And with your help, Lord, we will be better managers. In Jesus' name. Amen. Spirit of the living God, we thank you and we praise you for being all-knowing and all-sufficient God. We come before you with a thankful heart, a praise on our lips and an open heart. Today is the day that you have afforded us and we truly thank you and want to glorify your holy name. Lord, we ask that you transform our minds that we may gain mental health and wellness in this very moment. Lord, you did it for me and I know that you can do it again for someone else. You are a faithful Lord, and you have the ability to heal all manner of anxiety disorders, bipolar disorders, depression, eating disorders, dementia, schizophrenia, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Lord, we trust in your abilities to heal our psyche however you want. Lord, give us the wisdom to seek counseling to take the necessary medication or obtain whatever treatment we may need to become mentally well and healthy in your name, Jesus. Your word says that you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of a power and of love and of a sound mind. Lord, we need a sound mind to have a sufficient mental capacity to understand our actions and the actions of others. We surrender our human limitations to you, Lord, so we can get mentally well because we cannot do it without your power and your guidance. Lord, we love you and we praise you, great and loving Father. We know that you are answering because we are your children and we can ask anything and you will provide for us. You are faithful, and we will give you the glory in advance for the mental healing that is happening even now. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, friends. Welcome to this next segment of teaching on prayer. I hope that our 21 days of prayer and uh, our financial fast has been a blessing to you. And I hope that you have been blessed by this 24 hour um, prayer event. 
and it's been a joy for me to pop in and out of all of the things that we've had going on during this 24-hour prayer event to um, continue to teach on the importance and the power and the significance and even what the Word of God teaches about prayer. And so I want you to grab your Bible and join me in Luke chapter 11 and verse number 1 because I want to take some time and teach on the Lord's Prayer. In Luke 11 and verse 1 it says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And we know if you keep reading, this is then when Jesus begins to teach what we have come to know as the Lord's Prayer. Now, what's really interesting is that Jesus actually never prayed the Lord's Prayer. A lot of times we think just by virtue of the name, the Lord's Prayer, that this is the actual prayer that Jesus prayed. And he didn't actually pray this prayer. What he actually prayed is something called the high priestly prayer uh, that is in another place in the Gospels. The point that you need to understand about the Lord's Prayer is Jesus is responding to a request from the disciples to teach them how to pray. Now, it's interesting. The disciples were Jews, which means that they were religious and prayer was a part of their Jewish culture or custom. But they noticed the difference. They were observing Jesus pray and something about the way he prayed was different than the way that they prayed. And so these men that knew about prayer as a part of their Jewish culture says to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And then when he proceeds to give them and us is a prayer outline of, of how we ought to pray and some of the categories and things that we ought to cover with God and how we ought to spend our time with God in prayer. And that's what I want to uh, go over with you. Now, this is a prayer outline, and in this prayer outline, Jesus is teaching us really seven areas that we ought to cover when we pray. Uh, Matthew 6 and verse 9 picks up on this, and it goes this way. This, then, is how you should pray. So Matthew helps us to understand Jesus' teaching about these you know, areas of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Interestingly enough, just as there were seven stations in the tabernacle, the tabernacle was the meeting place, particularly when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt and moving into the promised land, wandering in the wilderness. The tabernacle is where the high priest would, would meet with God and where they would do all of the sacrificing. It was, it was the presence of God, the dwelling place of God in the midst of His people. Well, there were seven stations in the tabernacle. And very similarly, there are also seven parts of this prayer outline that Jesus is teaching. I want to give them to you. The first thing that He teaches us is, number one, connect with God relationally. This is why it starts off, Our Father who art in heaven. You don't have to relate to God formally. He is a loving Father. A lot of us think that we have to come to God with uh, flowerly language and we have to be so formal that that sometimes creates a barrier of connection. You can't go anywhere in prayer without first connecting with Him. God is a loving Father and you first have got to connect with Him that way. Now I know that we are in a day and time where some people have um, an inherent disconnect with this theology of God as a father because they didn't have a great connection with their heavenly father. But the point is, I want you to understand, regardless of, of how your earthly father was, um, God is not like that. He is our loving heavenly father. And so, Romans 8 and 15 says, You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. What that means is, regardless of the kind of relationship you have with your earthly father, God is our loving Heavenly Father. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to come with Him with a whole bunch of formalities. He is waiting with open arms to receive us. My kids aren't afraid of me. When they come in, they rush to give me a hug. That's the way that we ought to connect with God relationally. But the second thing is, number two, Worship His name. This is what Jesus means when He says, Hallowed be your name. This means 
worship His names. There's power in His name. The Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. One of my favorite scriptures is Proverbs 18 and 10 that says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run in and are saved. The message translation says it this way, God's name is a place of protection. The righteous can run there and be safe. So what this means is there's power in spending time worshiping the, just the names of God. God is our righteousness. That means He makes us clean. He is our sanctifier. That means He's called us and set us apart. He is our healer. He heals us of all of our diseases. He's our banner of victory. That means that He's defeated our enemies. He's our shepherd. He speaks to us and leads us. He's our peace. That means He is our peace in every storm. And He is our provider, which means He promised to supply all of our needs. So Jesus is saying, take some time in your worship and worship the names of God because the names of God denote His nature. And that's a, that's a form of thanksgiving. God, I thank you that you are my peace. I thank you that you are my shepherd. I thank you that you are my healer. That is a very, very powerful thing to do in your time of prayer. And I'm telling you, when you do that, it will reinvigorate and uh, infuse you with hope and encouragement because sometimes we forget these things. Sometimes under the pressure of life, we forget that God is our provider. But when you spend time worshiping His names, Gosh, you're reminded, wait a minute, why am I stressed out about this? He promised to supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory. So that's what it means when Jesus says, hallowed be your name. Here's the next thing, number three, pray His agenda first. The next thing that Jesus says is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In any relationship that's important to you, you should put their agenda first. If you really love someone, if you're committed to serving that person, it's about their agenda first, not yours. Well, guess what? God has got a prayer list. There are some things that are really important to Him, and it is about His will that is established in heaven also being established here on earth. In Matthew 6 and 33, He says, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. Once again, God has an agenda. He wants to see His will manifest in the earth. And these are the things that we ought to be praying for. Number four, depend on Him for everything. I love it. Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. This is about depending on God for everything. Even when you feel like you don't need anything, pray for it anyway. You know, a, a bad habit for many people is that they only go to God when they're in a bind, when they're in a jam, when they need something. And they're like, oh my gosh, God, I need help. But what God likes, and we talked about this in an earlier teaching segment, God wants us to depend on Him for everything. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That means that every single day, God wants us to go to Him and to get what we need for that day. You know, one of the things that I do, I told you about my appointment with God, it's at 5 a.m. And one of the things that I pray when I talk to God at 5 a.m. and the reason I, I start my day with Him, I want to put Him first and there's a lot of biblical teaching around why God should be first and what happens with the first determines the rest. I don't have time to get into that. But one of the things that I, that I pray in my time with the Lord is, God, before I open any email, before I respond, before I have any meeting, before I take any calls, before, before I, I do anything else. I need your wisdom. I need your guidance. I need you to give me what I need for this day. That is me depending on Him for everything. Psalm 121 in verse 1 says, I look up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. And here's another one that really, really challenges me every time I read this verse. Romans 14 and 23 says this, And everything that does not come from faith is sin. That when we don't say, God, I need your help, God says, you're not dependent on me. And he has an issue with that. Number five, get your heart right with God and with people. This is what Jesus means when he says, And forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. Now, I grew up with the old version. The old school version is forgive us of our trespasses. I remember as a young kid, I could barely say the word trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The whole point is we got to make sure that our heart is right with God and with people. And that's really significant. I pray that you and I never become desensitized to sin. I pray that we never allow the prevalence of sin and evil to desensitize us so that when our hearts are not right, we're no longer even bothered. See, what Jesus is talking about is making sure that our hearts are clean. And this is not just about you and the Lord. This is also about you and other people. And I know you may be thinking, well, how do I do that? One of the greatest things that you can do is to forgive people in advance. Because you know what? People are going to disappoint you. People are going to hurt you. People are going to let you down. And you know what I always can tell? If somebody is flying off the handle, if they're short with people, if they've got a short fuse and they're automatically barking at people and just, you know, always behaving like they got up on the wrong side of the bed, you know what that's a sign of? Their heart's not right. They haven't spent any time doing what Jesus tells us to do at this point in our prayer time. Lord, clean my heart. Forgive me of my trespasses. And, you know, sometimes in my prayer time, I say, Lord, forgive me not only of all of my sins that I, that I know I, I got wrong, but maybe there's some things that I didn't even realize that I did wrong or that I handled wrong. Lord, clean my heart up of that. So get your heart right with God and with people. Number six, engage in spiritual warfare. Because the very next line, he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, what's interesting, depending on the translation you read, um, it, it's hard sometimes for the English translators to get it exactly right because there are some nuances in the language between Aramaic and Greek and English. And so when it says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, it's kind of a bad English translation. The literal translation is, do not allow us to be led into temptation. It means, Lord, I know temptation is on Satan's agenda for me today, and I need you to keep it from me. I need you to help me. That is so good. Why? Because we have an enemy that hates our guts. And the interesting thing is, for many people, he's working harder to oppose us than we are to oppose him. And so every day what Jesus is saying at this point in our prayers, we ought to engage in spiritual warfare. We ought to make sure that we take up a stand and guard our heart and ask for the protection and strength of God to make sure that we don't fall into any of the trips, trips up, uh, the, the trip ups and traps that the enemy has for us. In Ephesians 6 and 12, it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Here's the last thing in this prayer outline, number seven. You end your prayer in this outline by expressing faith in God's ability. Jesus closes this prayer outline by saying, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Meaning you end by saying, God, I know that you're sovereign. I know that you're in control. It's all about you. Watch what Jesus says. For yours is the kingdom. That means that all rule belongs to you. Yours is the power. That means that all mightiness flows from you and that yours is the glory. That somehow, some way, God, you are going to be glorified. And you end with that. Jeremiah 32 and 17 says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Revelations 5.13 says, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Jesus says we end by expressing faith in God's ability. source of opportunity and growth. 
With hearts brimming with gratitude, we gather before you to offer our thanks for countless opportunities that have graced our lives and the achievements, both big and small, that have marked our journey. We celebrate the growth and progress that have shaped us into the individuals we are today. Thank you, dear Lord, for the opportunities that have opened doors for new experiences, learning, and personal development. We recognize that these opportunities have expanded our horizons and allowed us to explore the boundless possibilities of life. We express our gratitude for the achievements we have celebrated along our path, the milestones reached, goals achieved, and dreams realized. In each triumph, we see the fruits of our efforts and the rewards of our perseverance. Lord, we acknowledge that growth often comes through challenges and adversity. We thank you for the lessons learned in moments of difficulty, for they have contributed to our resilience and strength. May we continue to embrace opportunities for growth even in the face of obstacles. As we express our gratitude for opportunities and achievements, May we also remember those who may be longing for such opportunities. May we extend our support and encouragement to them, offering a helping hand and a word of inspiration. May we remain humble in our accomplishments, knowing that they are gifts of grace. May we use our achievements to make a positive impact on the world, sharing our blessings with others and contributing to the well-being of our communities. In your divine name, we offer this prayer of thanksgiving for opportunities and achievements. May we honor these blessings by continually seeking growth, embracing challenges, and striving to make a difference in the world. Amen. Father God, divine guide, through challenges and growth, with hearts filled with humility and gratitude, we come before you to offer our thanks for the challenges we faced along our journey. We recognize that these trials, though difficult, have been opportunities for personal growth and learning. We celebrate the resilience and strength that have been cultivated through adversity. Thank you, dear Lord, for the challenges that have tested our limits and pushed us beyond our comfort zones. In these moments of struggle, we have discovered our inner strength and resilience. We acknowledge that growth often emerges from the soil of adversity. We express our gratitude for the lessons we've learned through the trials we've endured. These lessons have deepened our understanding of ourselves and the world around us. May we continue to approach challenges with a spirit of curiosity and a willingness to learn. Lord, we understand that challenges are part of the human experience, and we thank you for the opportunities they provide for us to evolve and become better versions of ourselves. May we embrace adversity as a catalyst for growth, knowing that it can lead to greater wisdom and compassion. As we express our gratitude for challenges and growth, may we also extend our empathy and support to those who are currently facing difficulties. May we be sources of strength and encouragement for them reminding them that they too have the capacity to overcome. May we remain resilient in the face of adversity, knowing that you are with us every step of the way. Help us to view challenges as stepping stones on the path to personal and spiritual development. In your divine name, we offer this prayer of thanksgiving for challenges and growth. May we honor these blessings by approaching life's trials with courage, grace, and a steadfast spirit. Heavenly Father, divine source of light and guidance, with hearts uplifted in gratitude, 
We gather before you to offer our thanks for your profound gift of spiritual connection and the journey that leads us closer to your divine presence. We express our appreciation for the moments of insight, guidance, and the growth of our faith that graces our lives. Thank you, dear Lord, for the spiritual journey that has led us to seek a deeper understanding of your love and wisdom. In this journey, we find meaning, purpose, and a sense of belonging. We acknowledge that it is through our spiritual connection that we discover the profound truths that illuminate our path. We express our gratitude for the moments of insight and revelation that have filled our hearts with wonder and awe. In these moments, we glimpse the depths of your wisdom and the boundless love that surrounds us. Lord, we are thankful for the guidance that you provide on our spiritual path, whether through prayer, meditation, scripture, or the wisdom of spiritual teachers. May we remain open to your gentle nudges and trust in the divine path that unfolds before us. As we express our gratitude for our spiritual journey, may we also extend our hands in support and love to others on their paths of faith. May we be sources of encouragement and understanding allowing others to find their own connection with you. May our faith continue to grow and deepen, Lord, as we seek your presence in every aspect of our lives. May we be vessels of your love and your light, radiating your grace to all we encounter. In your divine name, we offer this prayer of thanksgiving for spiritual connection. May we honor this blessing by nurturing our faith and sharing the gift of spirituality with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Jesus 